Hello and welcome to our annual Julia S. Phelps Lecture in the Art and Humanities, this year featuring the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Matthew Akins. I'm Claudia Rizzini, the Executive Director of the Fellowship Program at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. Julia Phelps, for whom this series is named, was a Radcliffe College alumna and a beloved teacher in the Harvard's German department at the Harvard Extension School and here at Radcliffe. When Julia retired, her family, friends, and colleagues established this lecture at Radcliffe in her honor. We are grateful for their support, which has enabled us to welcome eminent writers and artists each year, including Jeremy Eichler, Kiesa Lehman, Minjin Lee, Marilyn Robinson, and last year, Jennifer Finney Boylan. Before we begin, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Julia Phelps' daughter, Susan Napier, and Susan's husband, Stephen Coit, who have joined us here today. <laughs> Let me also acknowledge the members of the Radcliffe Institute Leadership Society and all our donors, annual donors, whose generosity keeps Radcliffe programming free and open to the public. Thank you. Matthew Akins is the 2023-2024 Rita E. Hauser Fellow here at the Radcliffe. Originally from Nova Scotia, Matthew has been reporting from Afghanistan since 2009. In September 2021, he co-wrote an article demonstrating that a drone strike the US military had launched during its chaotic withdrawal from Kabul hadn't hit an ISIS militant, as the US government initially claimed, but had in fact killed a group of civilians, including children. On the strength of this work, Matthew was part of a team of journalists uh, who received the 2022 Pulitzer Prize in international, in international reporting for courageous and relentless reporting that exposed the vast civilian toll of US-led airstrikes, challenging official accounts of American military engagements. In 2022, Matthew published his first book, The Naked Don't Fear the Water, An Underground Journey with Afghan Refugees. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees currently estimate that there are 6.1 million refugees from Afghanistan worldwide, more than from any other country except Syria. In The Naked Don't Fear the Water, Matthew describes traveling alongside one such refugee, his friend Omar, on the harrowing journey from Afghanistan to Europe. As a former interpreter for US Special Forces, Omar should theoretically have been eligible for a special immigrant visa to repatriate to the United States. Except that, as Matthew writes in his book, Omar needed all sorts of paperwork that he'd never thought to collect over the years, letters of recommendations from his supervisors, copies of his employer's contract with the US government. Unable to gain any official benefit from his service to the US, Omar chose instead to take his chances on the road to Europe, and Matthew accompanied his friends on this dangerous journey. The result in the world of one reviewer is an expansive, immersive work that reads like the most gripply novel, but is the more, all the more compelling because the events are both true and ongoing a meticulously told story the words need to hear now more than ever. Posing as an Afghan migrant, Matthew crossed from Turkey to Greece in an inflatable rubber dinghy and resided for weeks in a refugee camp on the Greek island of Lesbos. Explaining one, co explaining one common tactic for accessing continental Europe from the Greek Isles, he describes how migrant Migrants would wait around nearby as tractor trailer tracks were loaded onto a ferry headed for the mainland. Matthew writes, if you were feeling reckless, you could crawl beneath a trailer and cling on above the axle like Odysseus escaping the cyclops under the belly of a sheep. 
Matthew's talk today is drawn from the project he has been working on during his fellowship here at Radcliffe, a new history of US military operations in Afghanistan, based on sources and access that have become available since the fall of Kabul. We're so pleased to count Matthew as a member of the Radcliffe community and to have the opportunity to learn from him today. And now a couple of words about the program's format. Following his remarks, Matthew will be joined on stage by Jacqueline Heselton for, the, for further discussion. Jacqueline is the Executive Director of the Journal International Society at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at the Harvard Kennedy School. She is a former international journalist with the Associated Press and a faculty member at the University of Rochester and the US Naval War College. Her work focuses on strategy, military intervention, US foreign policy, counterinsurgency, and terrorism. We will conclude the program with audience Q&A. Whether you are watching in person or online, you can submit your question using the Slido link, which is provided on the screen behind me and posted in the chat feature of the Zoom webinar. Matthew and Jacqueline will answer as many questions as they can in the time that we have together. And I wish to add one last thing. As you can imagine, a lecture on the morality of war will almost certainly touch on current events in Gaza. Many of us gathered in person and online have deeply held convictions about what is unfolding in the Middle East and how it is playing out here on campus and across our nation. However, Radcliffe Institute believes in open inquiry and we have a history of holding space for divisive conversations. In order to continue to honor the importance of inquiry, we must ensure that we hold space so that all can be heard, both those with whom we agree and those with whom we dissent. Today, our speaker will share his perspective. This is his moment to do so. And now, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Matthew Aikens to the stage. Thank you, Claudia. And thank you to the Radcliffe Institute, to my fellow fellows, uh, to the undergraduate research partners who've worked with me this year, Muqtadar Omari and Kendall Carl, who's, who helped me put together the slides you'll be seeing today. And uh, just a warning that we'll touch on some disturbing content, potentially at least involving war crimes. So I've spent my whole career covering war, and if I thought this year was going to be a respite from all that, clearly has not been, um, you know, the, the events the horrific war in Gaza has touched us all. Um, and we've seen freedom of speech uh, come under concerted attack here in our community. And so I want to, as a journalist, express my solidarity with everyone who is speaking out, who's using the right to free speech, especially our students. Now, as, as Claudia mentioned, my project this year is about trying to understand a war that I, I witnessed. Um, I lived for many years in Kabul. I was there during the fall of the government. And as tragically as it ended, I think it's opened up uh, new opportunities to understand what happened during America's longest war. Sometimes it's only after the end of something that you can begin to fully understand it. So that's involved going back, traveling to Afghanistan, um, to Taliban control uh, Afghanistan, and visiting people in places that you couldn't access before. And part of it this year at Radcliffe has involved um, exploring ideas, ways of reframing the conflict. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So what makes war lawful and moral? I think to some people, uh, the question doesn't even make sense. How could something as abhorrent as war uh, be either? And I'm not here today to argue that it is. But I want to talk about um, the the ways in which uh, people think of war as lawful or, or, or moral. And my argument is that this plays a central role in our political discourse 
and it serves to legitimize some kinds of violence uh, and delegitimize others. So to take the example that's obviously in all of our minds, we have more than 34,000 people killed in Gaza. 70% of them are women and children. And uh, there's a fierce debate that's raging over you know, uh, whether and how this can be justified. Um, recently, there were reports and response to reports that the International Criminal Court was preparing arrest warrants for um, Hamas and Israeli officials. President, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu you know, responded saying that the Israeli army, the IDF, is one of the most moral militaries in the world. It takes endless measures to prevent civilian casualties. And it's precisely by this idea that Israel doesn't intend to cause civilian casualties that it and its supporters distinguish their violence from that of Hamas, who, in killing you know, more than 1,000 people in Israel, is accused of having done so deliberately, intentionally targeting civilians. So I would argue that this question of, of war's legality and morality is of paramount importance today. Um, and it also reflects a widespread consensus that civilians should not be targeted. But what are the laws of war, international humanitarian law, as it's called? So you have customary law and tradition, and you have international treaties, the most important of which uh, is the Geneva Convention of 1949 and several additional protocols. The convention is ratified by every UN member state. There's also later treaties like the Rome Statute, which created the International Criminal Court in 2002. Uh, and they're concerned with limiting the, the destruction and violence of war and protecting, particular protecting civilians. Today, scholars talk about a convergence in international humanitarian law, or IHL, uh, where it should apply across a wide range of actors and conflicts. But the history of these laws is actually of them being quite limited in scope. And so, so as, as Helen Kinsella points out in her Critical History of the Civilian, um, it was at the Council of Claremont in 1095 that Pope Urban II first proclaimed the truce of God among Christendom. Um, that was also where the first the calls for what became the First Crusade uh, were heard, which redirected violence outside of Europe's borders. And up through the 19th century, the laws of war were seen as only applying to the civilized world, to the West, uh, not to colonial wars against native peoples or internal rebellions. To quote Elbridge Colby, a US Army captain scholar, um, in his 1927 article, How to Fight Savage Tribes, against elusive savage or semi-savage people and against tribal units which wage war as complete tribes, the method much, must be, as the British Colonel Fuller has said, more brutal. In fact, among savages, war includes everyone. There is no distinction between combatants and non-combatants. And international treaties didn't extend the laws of war to cover internal conflicts and civil wars until the 1949 convention. So there's an interesting parallel, perhaps, with the way that liberal rights of property or suffrage were only initially applied to a subset of white men. Um, the laws of war only applied to a subset of war. Uh, despite their increasing uh, ubiquity today. And that's a point I want to return to later in the way that, again, restricting certain kinds of violence can authorize others. So the foundational principle of IHL is what's called the, the principle of distinction, which is that you have to distinguish between combatants, people who fight, and non-combatants, people who don't take part in fighting. And that includes civilians, but also prisoners of war. And the, so the, the, there can never be, the civilians can never be intentionally harmed, but of course they may be incidentally harmed. You might have what's often called collateral damage. Uh, and so the question is, is that damage, is that collateral damage proportionate? Uh, is the attack distinguishing properly between military targets and civilians? And that, that I would argue, is really where the debate is today. You know, what collateral damage is excessive? Uh, that is what our reporting you know, at the Times focused on, the way that uh, civilian casualties from US airstrikes were uh, systemically undercounted or ignored. Incidents like the drone strike where 
family was mistaken for terrorists and killed. But um, what I want to talk about today is something different. I want to talk about intentional acts of violence against civilians, outright war crimes. IHL bans collective punishment, hostage taking, forced displacement, torture, execution, or other punishments handed down without an impartial court. Uh, and to quote the Geneva Conventions, physical or moral coercion. Those are all prohibited acts against non-combatants. So we're talking about murder, torture, inter forced disappearance, uh, collective punishment, and other unambiguous war crimes committed by the US's Afghan allies and the Taliban. So March 27th, 2009. It's a warm spring day in the border town of Spinbolbak in southern Afghanistan. I met the man who would become the US's most important ally in the war, Abdul Razik. Earlier, I'd befriended two drug smugglers in Pakistan who'd offered to introduce me to Razik, saying he was helped ship two metric tons of opium every month um, to Iran. And so I traveled with them and met Razik. And even though I was new to the region, I knew enough to be puzzled by Razik's success. Why was the US military, which was supposed to be supporting democracy and human rights in Afghanistan, partnering with someone who was so widely known to be uh, involved in murder and disappearances? Everyone in town knew about the Taliban suspects who were tortured and dumped in the desert, and of course, about Razik's involvement in the drug trade. Now, in fact, as we now know, the US military had known about these allegations for years, but had ignore them as part of a pattern of ignoring abuses by uh, allies they thought were useful in the fight against terrorism, who were useful in hunting down the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. But by 2009, uh, that mentality was starting to change. The war was going badly in Afghanistan. The Taliban were growing stronger. And pr the new president, Barack Obama, had ordered a surge of tens of thousands of US troops who were going to be guided by a US military doctrine called counterinsurgency theory, or coin, which was held to have saved the day in Iraq. So coin, according to coin, the US had been fighting the war the wrong way. They'd been focused on the enemy and ignoring the true terrain of the battlefield, which was the population. And in order to win the population, the US had to win the hearts and minds of the Afghan people. And that meant that brutality, corruption, would backfire by producing more resistance. In a speech that year, uh, General Stanley McChrystal, the commander of US forces, explained what he called coin mathematics. If a military operation killed two out of 10 insurgents, instead of eight remaining, there were, quote, more likely to be as many as 20, because each one you killed has a brother, father, son, and friends. So brutality would backfire. That was Coyne's promise that the good was also expedient, that the war would be just. And this is really a central tenet of the US military's beliefs about the laws of war. To quote the official manual on the subject, the law of war is a part of our military heritage, and obeying it is the right thing to do. But we also know that the law of war poses no obstacle to fighting well and prevailing. So in 2009, there's a fierce debate raging in the US government over what to do about so-called bad actors like Abdul Razik, whose corruption and brutality would threaten the success of the war. And some elements in the US government started targeting him. The Drug Enforcement Administration uh, you know, raided large cases of drugs in his area, arrested one of his commanders. Some people wanted to go after Razik himself. But ultimately, the military commanders on the ground who were working with him to fight the Taliban thought he was too important, too effective of a fighter. They needed him. And they supported him. And, and beginning uh, that year, the US military began to assign advisors to Razik. They wanted to try to reform him. And they definitely wanted to use him in the surge in the fight against the Taliban. And he would become uh, police chief of Kandahar in 2011. And rise to become one of the most powerful men uh, in the country before his assassination in 2018. And here he is with a three-star general um, in 2014. So during Razik's 
reign uh, in the South. Myself, other journalists, human rights groups, UN investigators documented an extensive campaign of war crimes committed by forces under his command, executions, uh, disappearing people, torture. One report by the UN Committee Against Torture in 2017 said there was numerous incredible allegations against Razek that he was involved in severe human rights abuses, extrajudicial killings, and secret detention centers. So this was the kind of, and here's some, some photos that were posted on social media. This is the kind of brutality that was, was supposed to backfire. Well, did it? Now, the way the surge took place actually gives us an interesting comparison. It was focused on two provinces in the south that were the Taliban um, base of support, their, their strongholds, Kandahar and Helmand. Both received roughly equivalent investments of US troops and money. And, but what happened with bad actors like Razak was very different. In, in Helmand, which was under the control of the Marines, they've stuck much closer to the coin playbook. They pushed out um, some problematic actors. There was no strongman like Razak who was uh, in control. The UN did this series of reports on systemic torture in Afghan prisons, which is a problem across the entire country. But the worst uh, abuses by the police were consistently found to be in Kandahar under Razak. By contrast, the UN found very little uh, systemic torture, no systemic torture, and, and I, you know, much less in Helmand. And we had attested this. In 2014, the surge came to an end. Afghan forces were supposed to be taking the lead in combat. Taliban launched a daring counteroffensive uh, against these two provinces in the south. And in Helmand, the Afghan government forces fared disastrously. Um, by the end of that fighting season, they'd lost large swaths of the northern districts. Razak, on the other hand, rallied the Republican forces in Kandahar. He fought back against the Taliban. Again, both provinces had large US air bases. So the following year, uh, things went even worse in Helmand for the government. And the insurgents arrived at doorstep of the provincial capital. And Razak led counteroffenses into neighboring provinces. Um, he successfully defended Kandahar. By 2017, as you can see, Helmand was one of the worst um, provinces in the country in terms of the level of Taliban control and insecurity. Whereas Kandahar was, while heavily affected, was, was faring much better under Razak. So, Clearly, Razik's success, uh, brutality was no impediment to his success. Uh, he, in fact, became increasingly popular across Afghanistan for bringing s some stability and security to Kandahar. You could travel around the country and see his photo on checkpoints and in taxi cabs. He appeared on the national news. People made songs about him. Not since the late Northern Alliance commander, Ahmad Shah Massoud, did any one figure united anti-Taliban sentiment across the country, uh, like Razak. And after his death in 2017, 2018, he became a kind of national icon for one side of this civil war, at least. Now, Razak is far from the only example of someone who succeeded in spite of the brutality. In fact, again and again, the US military partnered with allies who were accused of abuses because they felt like these were the most uh, efficient, successful fighters against the Taliban, even despite what Coyne predicted, that brutality would backfire. We call it the Coyne Paradox. And the Coyne Paradox is something that troubled me for many years uh, until, excuse me, until I came across the work of Stathis Kalibis, the political scientist. And in this book, Kalibis asked why civil wars are characterized by Barbaric violence against civilians, right? I would argue this is basically a common sense proposition. Some of you may have seen the new film by Alex Garland, Civil War, about a civil war in America. What's the first thing that happens when a civil war comes to America? You start to have atrocities, mass graves and killing of civilians. So why is brutality such a uh, you know, ubiquitous part of civil war, Kalibas asks. Is it the people's irrationality? Is it a, related to ideology, cultural backwardness. After dismissing these arguments, he posits that it's 
the outgrowth of the military characteristics of these kinds of conflicts, uh, of the technology of guerrilla war, which is also what Coyne, the US military doctrine was saying, you know, this is a certain kind of war where the population and not the terrain is the battlefield. But Calivas argues that this creates incentives for coercive violence against civilians, and that the line blurs between civilians and combatants. Now, if you read the US military manual on COIN, it stresses that in an irregular war, it's confusing who's a civilian, who's an enemy, because no one's wearing uniforms. That's not Calivas's point. What Calivas is saying is that in a conflict where you don't have clear front lines, violence becomes jointly produced by combatants and civilians because the latter have the information that the former need to fight their enemies. The location of IEDs, of bombs, or army patrols, the identities of insurgents and government supporters. So civilians can actually produce violence, typically through denunciation. People with inform give information, people with info connect with people with guns and people get killed. Civilians do have agency and a capacity to harm each other, and that blurs the boundary between combatants and non-combatants, Khalifas argues. Uh, civil war is also a process of rival state building. So civilians can participate in the conflict in many ways that fall short of being an outright combatant with a weapon, right? They could be spies, they could be informants, they could be logistical supporters, ideologues, civil servants. So again, Khalifa's argument is not that legitimacy doesn't matter at all or the brutality can never backfire. In fact, he argues that certain kinds of, of indiscriminate violence, like an airstrike just randomly hitting some houses, you know, that doesn't actually produce any effect. It can backfire. But selective violence, where you target people based on their actions or their specific individual identities, is effective in a kind of straightforward way, you know, at coercing people to do things um, to support one or the other side in a civil war. Do this or I'll kill you. So it's not just about carrots and hearts and minds, it's about sticks. And it is, after all, competition. And the side that sticks are likely to be a lot more effective in warfare, and the side that uses them is going to have a very significant advantage over the side that's not. So is this relevant for the US war in Afghanistan? Now, since the coup uh, d'etat by the Afghan communists in 1978, the country's been involved in 40 decades of conflict. And although it's carried many names by its participant, a jihad, a people's war, a war on terror, it has always been a civil war in that it was fought by Afghans against Afghans for control of the state. Even at the height of the US and Soviet occupations, the majority of casualties on all sides were Afghans. So it was a civil war. It was also largely irregular. Um, there were moments that were more like conventional battles, but for the most part, you had fragmented and overlapping territorial control, guerrilla warfare, insurgency, and that was certainly true um, after 2001 when the US overthrew the Taliban. So it's a, it is an irregular civil war of the kind discussed by Khalifas. And we, we find, now looking at this pattern of violence that documented about people like Razik, that it was really selective violence that, that was largely being practiced, right? The Taliban kidnapped, assassinated, and terrorized government supporters, collaborators. And Razik did the same. He targeted people for a reason. Many of the people who um, you know, were executed were believed to be Taliban suspects. It, in that way, it was different from the kind of gratuitous abuse against prisoners of war carried out by US soldiers in the early years of the war, poorly su supervised. This abuse fulfilled a, a function. So in this light, I think that coin begins to appear as a kind of myth of US exceptionalism, that the war in Afghanistan could be fought differently from what we see in the literature on civil war and counterinsurgency. Um, there are you know, many studies that, that document the use of coercion against civilians, even conflicts um, undertaken by Western liberal democracies, um, like the British in, in Kenya, and, uh, Malaya, Palestine, the French in Algeria. There's also contemporary cases like Sri Lanka, 
and Syria, where brutality has been no impediment. Um, to quote scholar Jacqueline Hazelton, who joins us today, the bad guys win is not the answer that US forces, policymakers, or civilians want to hear about counterinsurgency success, but the historical record is clear. So if this is right about how civil war, war works, right, if all this is correct, what it means is that the US didn't face a paradox in Afghanistan with Razak. It faced a dilemma. It found itself intervening on one side of a civil war that blurred the distinction between fighters and civilians and incentivized unlawful acts of violence in order to win. And the solution was a division of labor, where these acts were carried out by proxy forces on the ground, something that the scholar Lale Halili has pointed out as a common feature of liberal counterinsurgency, a reliant on local clients. OK. So why does this matter? Again, to return to our original point, you know, war is hell. If, if it's so uh, widely understood that brutality is ubiquitous in civil war, what's the significance of all this? Well, I think we need to return to the importance of the laws of war, of international humanitarian law, um, in to how we think about war, to how we legitimize certain wars and delegitimize other forms of violence. You know, the, the, hum, the <clears throat> historian Samuel Moyne argues in his book, Humane, that today the in institutional preoccupation we see with, of, with lawful warfare uh, in the US military, let's call it IHL legalism, took off after the Vietnam War in the 1970s and can be considered part of the ascendancy of the global human rights movement. And as one points out, this is a period where we see the fervor of the anti-war movement replaced by the fervor of humanitarians like Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch, who sought, instead of ending war, to make it humane and legal. And so Moyne contrasts this with the pacifist tradition exemplified by Leo Tolstoy. Um, pacifists who argued that it was absurd or even harmful to try to make war humane, and it should be outlawed instead, an argument which probably seems naive or outlandish uh, in our current age. As another way of thinking about wars, morality, and lawfulness, I would add uh, another Russian, Leon Trotsky, who uh, in Their Moral and Ours, his 1938 pamphlet, argues that War is inescapably political. The legitimacy of war is inescapably political. It's only by its ends that war and its horrors can be justified. So he says um, about the Spanish Civil War, whoever accepts the end, victory over Franco, must accept the means, civil war with its wake of horror and crimes. Referring to the US, he says, history has different yardsticks for the cruelty of the northerners and the cruelty of the Southerners in the Civil War. And that is just the kind of logic we see in historical justifications for the deliberate uh, attacks, uh, mass slaughter of German and Japanese civilians by Allied bombers in World War II. So these deliberately targeting civilians was something that was justified at the time by the, that it was a means toward the end of defeating fascism. So Moyne's argument is that we've come very far from thinking this way about war. Uh, and instead, we're living in an age that seeks to make war humane, uh, an age where we're concerned about the way that war is war waged and not the fact of war itself. I think it's part of a broader depol depoliticization of morality under neoliberalism, um, as described by Jessica White. So, do demands for immunity for those who are deemed innocent, thereby sanction the destruction of those who fight back? Is humane war a recipe for endless but just war? Now, I think that the lesson of Abdul Razak, or the question that 
that Razak's story poses for us is whether this kind of war, or this kind of just war is at all possible in a conflict like Afghanistan's. Is IHL legalism an adequate paradigm to understanding civil war? Does our preoccupation with just war, legal war, reflect a fundamental mistake about the nature of war itself? What if we've taken a subset of wars, that is, conventional battles between armies fought on mostly European battlefields, and confused them with a much longer and uglier history of colonialism, rebellion, subjugation, one that continues to this present day? The vast majority of conflicts in the past century have been within and not between states. Civil wars, rebellions, counterinsurgencies, genocides. We live in an age of irregular warfare, of asymmetric clashes with militant groups, of battles not between armies for territory, but for the control of populations. These are conflicts that arise from the contestation or the breakdown of the course of power of the state. There are wars to repurpose Clausewitz as an extension of politics, and civilians are not exempt from the state's monopoly of violence. To return one last time to Abdul Razik, the systemic pattern of, of torture that was identified by the UN and was uh, most, most prevalent in areas controlled by Razik was a response to the dysfunction of the Afghan courts, which relied almost entirely on confessions for convictions. Uh, so the Afghan courts were seen as corrupt, dysfunctional, overloaded by the demands of the war and the surge. And by murdering, disappearing, and torturing, Razik sought through war crimes to restore the function of law. So, what does this all mean? I, I'm not saying, certainly, that murder and torture are justified, or that we should completely abandon international humanitarian law. I'm, I'm actually not here to make a prescriptive argument uh, to you today about those things. But I do think there are a few implications um, that we can draw from this that might be interesting to think about. So the first is that we need to be wary of the myth that brutality is always counterproductive. And it's actually a very comforting myth, right? Because it doesn't make it tempting. If brutality always backfires, then there's no reason to be involved in it. And that's clearly not the case. I don't think that's supported by the historical record or what happened in the case of Abdul Razik. Two, we have to be wary of the dichotomy between victims and perpetrators that often underlies a lot of journalism about human rights issues that sees victims as only victims. And again, the answer is not because that justifies murder and torture, but because if we see people only as victims, then we obscure the logic behind these actions. Many of these victims, and this is one of the things that's interesting now about going back to Afghanistan and often re-reporting stories that I've worked on, is that people are much more willing to admit that they were members of the Taliban. Sometimes they're proud of it now. The Taliban are the government, and they defeated the, the occupiers. And so you understand why people were targeted. And so seeing people as only as purely as victims obscures, um, I think, the third important point here, which is that Violence against civilians is instrumental. It has a strategic logic. Its purpose is coercion, is linked to the political aims of a war. And yet, violence against civilians is also unspeakable under IHL legalism. It's completely prohibited. And so we need to pay attention to the way that prohibited practices 
can nonetheless be authorized through impunity for the perpetrators, institutionalized in the regularity of their presence and purpose, as in the case of torture in Afghan government prisons. This is a point that Elizabeth Jean Wood makes about sexual violence uh, in wartime, that things that are, never, never, you know, that are unspeakable can nevertheless be authorized. And finally, I think we need to reconsider the relationship between countries like the United States, engaged, liberal democracies engaged in counterinsurgencies and wars overseas, and local proxies like Abdul Razak. We have to see it in light of the instrumentality of this kind of violence toward the war's aims, and the way that these unspeakable acts can become authorized and institutionalized as a form of practice. and become, in the case of someone like Abdul Razak, a kind of division of labor where someone does our dirty work. Thank you. So I'd like to invite uh, Jacqueline Hazelton at the stage for this session. Please welcome her. Thank you. That's a great talk. I really appreciated it. Please. The, the work that you have done in Afghanistan is startling in, in its degree of intimacy. I've read uh, some of the work you've done on um, warlords, and then, of course, the tremendous New York Times series on civilian casualties. The problem with civilian casualties in Iraq and Afghanistan was never a secret to the people who were paying attention, but it took this, the resources of an institution like the New York Times and the persistence and determination and bravery of the journalists working on the story in order to bring it to a wider audience. And that, while we're talking about free speech, I'll put in a pitch for the importance of journalism in revealing what is going on within these wars, around these wars, and the, the elements that creep out good and bad from the use of violence as a political tool. I think one of the most important points that you and others make, Matt, is that violence is a tool to achieve political objectives. If we look at history, that is a fact. We don't have to like it. We can find it distinctly distasteful or unpalatable. And yet, under certain conditions, it works. So I'll add other examples to uh, your particular warlord in asking the question of why we even care about warlords. We can think about Sheikh Ahmed Ibu uh, Risha in Anbar in Iraq, who helped lead the Anbar Awakening and was hailed for one brief moment in time as the George Washington of Iraq until he was assassinated because politics is a dirty business. We can talk about, um, we can talk about uh, General Sherman in the American Civil War, burning his way across the South successfully, achieving the political goals that Lincoln wanted him to achieve using brute force, using brutality. And that is not how we usually think about the Civil War, but that's part of our history that we have to line up along with stories about Afghanistan, Iraq, Suharto in Indonesia, President Diem in Vietnam. We can go on and on listing strong men who have used force to achieve their political aims, 
most notably power, and have had it last for a greater or lesser amount of time. Suharto was in power for, what, 30 plus years? So I think the first question, Matt, that I have for you, and we're very much looking forward to your questions and the questions of the online audience as well. So I can see them here in Slinko. So please send in what you would like Matt particularly to address. So my opening question is, why do we care about warlords? Why do they matter? If we're talking about civil war, if we're talking about insurgency and counterinsurgency, if we're talking about rebellion, however we want to define the problem of the use of force for political ends within a, si a single polity, why do we care about the warlords? Well, I think, I think that you know, individuals' personalities are one way to make people care. Uh, talking about Abdul Razak as a way to personalize the story. He was a really significant figure. There's no denying that. But he was part of a, of a system and a much wider pattern. Um, so that's, that's one reason why it's useful, but also potentially misleading to focus on, on individuals. I mean, why should we care about a warlord like Abdul Razak? Well, because our government was arming and funding him. You know, Every bullet his soldiers fired was being paid for by U.S. and Western taxpayers, right? He was um, working very closely with the United States military, so there's no doubt that we were responsible uh, for his actions. And I think that it's a job of journalists to expose what they are in the first place, right? If we're in denial about them, that's also a problem. Yeah, and once again, that's not palatable. We are responsible for Razik and his brothers and sisters in the power game. Uh, turning to some audience questions. Um, you talked about the distinction between civilians and fighters. And you have written absolutely fascinating stories about going undercover with fighters. Can you talk a little bit about, not IHL in particular, because we'll get there in a minute, but your normative feelings about going undercover, about working with Afghans, basically to tell the world that they're doing terrible things, about um, potentially putting civilians in danger through your work, well, I'll talk about one aspect that I think is particularly relevant to the work that I'm doing here, which is that I've really been trying to talk to uh, perpetrators, people who are involved in, in the fight, you know, and try to understand what they were thinking, how they understood their own actions. Um, not only perpetrators, but more broadly, people in, involved in battle. And I think that, you know, it, one of the potentially misleading tendencies in in journalism about war is, a, is, is the focus on, the exclusive focus on, on innocent victims, innocent people. Of course, we all want to recognize the suffering of innocent people and, and see them protected, but wars aren't just about innocent people. And, and again, I've, as I've tried to explain, the line can be blurred in all sorts of ways. And it's really important, I think, to understand why people do things and who benefits from them. And that's not always easy. I mean, it's not, it's not always easy to sit down and talk with people about murders they've committed. It's not easy to get them to talk about in the first place. But it, you also have to, as a journalist, um, set aside your own feelings and recognize that they have a perspective, that they have reasons for what they did. Um, that war you know, is, it poses a very big challenge to morality. And it's easy for us to condemn things, and we do. But, but if we were in that situation, if we were fighting for what people see as a battle for survival, which is very much the case for, for Afghans who have been locked in this terrible conflict that's been fed by world polit superpowers, um, they, they have to make choices. And they, and, they, and they make those choices. And it's important to, I think, give them space uh, and understand their reasoning for doing so. Uh, 
I think this is one of the most powerful things about Matt's work and about this kind of word journalism generally is that you are giving agency to the individuals who are part of the crowd. They're civilians, they're collateral damage, they're innocents, they're uh, spies for the Taliban, whatever it is, they're not individuals in charge of their own lives and their choices, but what you're showing us is that they are. Yeah, they have, they have agency, definitely. I mean, they're also, I think, part of larger structures, so that's always the tension is in doing this kind of journalistic work is how, you know, how much can you bring in a more structural uh, you know, explanation for what's going on so that you see patterns, that you're not just a prisoner of exceptionalist narratives about this particular war, and you, you go into the research and you, and you begin to see um, uh, structures, but it's, it's always a balance because I'm not, I'm not an academic. I'm not writing you know, the, the work of, of, I'm not doing what you do. <laughs> so, so I'm trying to make it comprehensible to people who come in on their you know, afternoon. Um, because they care about understanding more. So, so it, is a, it is a balance, it's definitely a tension. A number of the questions that are rolling in, keep them coming, people, is about the multiple roles of civilians in Afghanistan. If civilians understood the same distinction between civilian and fighter that those of us in this room probably share, how civilians felt about the Taliban, how, to what degree it's a moral choice on the part of the United States to outsource the brutality to Afghans. There's this whole bundle of problems involving the civilian role in the war and in wars more generally. And I don't know if there is anything like a comprehensive answer because we're talking about millions of individuals, but if you can talk a little bit about that relationship between the individual and their view of what's going on in their world and in the larger world that's affecting them so powerfully. Sure, yeah. I mean, one of the things that you learn when you talk to people um, in, a, in places like Afghanistan is that their perspective is often quite different from you know, the perspective of, of journalists or international humanitarian law or, or human rights groups or even the US military. Uh, people who have been, su you know, subjected to so much violence really value security and stability. That was one reason why Abdul Razak became so popular. It's not because, you know, Afghans love brutality or anything like that. It's because they saw his brutality as actually something that would be successful against the Taliban. You wanted a powerful strongman in your corner to defend you. And it was more important that your kid be able to go to school without being blown up by a suicide bomb than it was to have, you know, freedom of speech or, uh, <coughs> Of, you know, Western rule of law. These are the terrible dilemmas that people face. Um, and I think that we have to understand how diff different those are from, from often the, the way that we see things. Uh, it doesn't make, doesn't make it necessarily correct um, or legitimize, you know, war crimes, but I would say not just, not just people in Afghanistan. A large portion of this country I think doesn't see anything wrong with, with war crimes to some degree. You know, if you look at the way that um, President Trump appealed to you know a huge part of his base by pardoning American soldiers who'd been involved uh, in war crimes during his presidency, these are seen as there's a I think there's a strand that we often as liberals, you know, academics or journalists, um, we, we we ignore a place where we fear to tread, which is just how much this vision of a kind of existential struggle. Um, the world is an existential struggle, um, appeals to people, and where you have to, you know, fight dirty uh, in order to survive. And I think that we've done a really poor job um, of, of, of understanding that perspective. I think the bottom line that comes out of your work um, and comes out of this question of IHL is the realization that not all morality is the same, that liberal values are not everyone's values, that my liberal values may be different when I talk about policy preferences than what your policy preferences are when you espouse the same liberal values. 
a lot of what you've been talking about comes down to this in terms of international humanitarian law and in terms of war fighting. Can I present you with this proposition for a final comment? Well, I think that um, while it's true there's a lot, you know, everyone has different values to some extent, certain values really do matter. They form, they have a kind of hegemonic role. They, they're essential discourse, you know, the ideas about what kinds of violence are right and what kinds of violence are not legitimate are, are really at the center of, of these raging debates that we're having about wars in places like Gaza and elsewhere. And so there are really strong normative commitments that are embedded uh, in our legal systems and in our institutions, and they often conceal, you know, paper over these kinds of fractures or differences. Um, and I think exploring them, understanding them, taking them them seriously uh, is is really important. All right, I said that was the last question, but I have a follow up. Okay. <laughs> I'll just sneak a two, Harvard two finger in there. Um, given all that you've said and what you've given us as a group to think about, international humanitarian law is not enforceable. There is no power behind it. It has no battalions, as Stalin said of the Pope. So what good is it? Well, I, I think it, it does have real force. I think the reason why you know, Netanyahu is so worried about the ICC is because he understands this is a crucial terrain for wars, ideological wars over the legitimacy of, of, of killing people. And so it doesn't matter in the sense that maybe you know, human rights groups would like to see it matter, where, yes, the international justice team swoops in and enforces these ICC warrants. But it, but it also doesn't mean that, oh, well, all war is brutal and, and everyone just gets to act as they please, I think there are really important, uh, you know, ideological commitments and um, stakes here in terms of how we understand the laws of war, and that's why I, th I really do believe that um, it was—it's so troubling to consider this kind of violence against civilians as as part of the inherent function of the kind of war we went to, because it—it's it's almost a kind of unspeakable knowledge that would upset. Um, the ideological justification for the morality of our war. All right, a th second follow-up. I can't help it. <laughs> this is such an intriguing discussion. Morality, the laws of war, uh, the protection of civilians, how does all that stack up against a state's responsibility to provide the very ba most basic possible thing a state can provide, which is security for its people. This is one of the things that makes the Israel wo Israeli war in Gaza so troubling. Netanyahu wants to make Israel and Israelis safe again. And that is a person that is a perfectly reasonable goal, although it may very well not be an attainable one, and we can raise serious questions about how Israel and the IDF are going about it. But at the same time, and this is a question that goes back to the ancients, what are the rights of the individual, the civilian? Think about Antigone, right? Uh, Antigone has the right and the need to bury her brother, and she has refused it the, because the state believes that this will not be good for the state. And the value of the state is greater than that of any single individual. So how do you, how do you square that circle? How do you decide which matters more and when? I, mean, I think it just shows how hollow this kind of proceduralism about you know, lawful war can be. And, it's really a question of, of, of ends and not means. It's a question of do you conceive of what Israel's doing as self-defense or is it part of an occupation that complicates the idea of self-defense, right? And that is a political question um, that can't be addressed by IHL and also not one that I really want to get into right now. So <laughs> thank you very much. Matt, thank you so much for this discussion, for your talk.
Thank you. For the important work that you do. You. I'd like to welcome Claudia back. Yes, thank you, Matthew, for your important journalistic work and for the terrific presentation. Thank you, Jacqueline, for engaging in conversation with Matthew. I want to thank the audience for your questions, both online and here in the room. This program has been recorded and it will be online uh, in about a week at radcliffe.harvard.edu. And with that, I wish you all the best and a great rest of the day. Thank you.